I would like to begin by welcoming and thanking you all for joining us for this edition of the WLCU Youth Community Talks. Today we are fortunate enough to be in the presence of Mr. George Haid, an international multilingual correspondent, anchor, and document producer, currently the head of news operation for Lebanon, uh, MTV Lebanon. Through this community talk, Mr. Haid will touch on the country's most recent downfall and what it will take to rise again. Providing a comprehensively raw overview of the current situation in Lebanon and the different factors that have led to the status quo. Mr. George Aid's extensive profile entails experience where he worked for several outlets, including Voice of Lebanon and Sky News Arabia, where he reported on several humanitarian socio-political issues and is known to tackle taboo and delicate subjects. In 2011, he was voted by the people as one of the top three reporters in Lebanon. And in 2012, he was among the first team to enter Aleppo as a reporter with Sky News Arabia to cover the Syrian war from a humanitarian perspective. Today, we thank Mr. Aid for allotting time to speak with us. Amidst the unfortunate and harsh reality, the citizens of Lebanon are facing on a day-to-day -day basis. To provide us with an on-the-ground experience, sharing his knowledge. We thank you. Before I hand it over to Mr. Aid, I'd just like to mention that over the duration of the talk, if questions do arise, we encourage you to write them in the chat directed to the WLCU Q&A user. And in the last 15 minutes of the call, we will dedicate to, the, um, to Mr. Aid answering your questions. Um, Please note that the contact information will be shared in the um, Zoom chat. So if anyone is interested in contacting you after the call, please don't hesitate to take a check in there. Um, so without further ado, the floor is yours, Mr. George Haid. Thank you, Christina, for the introduction. Thank you, everyone, for joining us, for sparing your time and being with us tonight. I'm very happy to meet you all, even though we're meeting virtually, as is everything these days with Corona. So the reason I didn't want to uh, adjourn our meeting tonight and our uh, discussion is that I strongly believe that you guys out there are the real uh, treasure Lebanon has. And I do hope that at some point you'll be able to voice out your opinion and be a part of our country's political decision because you have been exposed to democracy, you have, you are, each and every one of you has built a successful story outside of Lebanon. And now our country needs this experience, needs these fresh voices and fresh faces. So what led us to this disaster? At the beginning, we wanted to talk about the economical crisis. That is now part of our past. It is still here, but I think we have bigger fish to fry. So the main problem we had, and that was, that was the problem that also caused the crash down, the economic crash down, is corruption. Okay, it's a tiny word, but in Lebanon, it is equal to the national anthem. And I do mean it. I mean, I've been in the business of journalism for 20 years. 20 years, it gets more corrupt than the other. Every year, it's more corrupt than the other. It, it, we, we went beyond level red with corruption. And to tell you the truth, out of a personal experience, I'm 26 years old now, almost, and I've never voted. Not because I don't want to have my, I don't want to really benefit from this right, but I never found anyone to vote for. No one was honest enough to present any solutions for our problems. No one was honest enough to help us sustain our country or to at least have a plan for the country. So these, elements altogether led to a downfall of the system. The banks were lending money for the government. The government was spending money on travel, luxury, corruption, uh, let's say uh, delusional projects, multi-million dollar bridges that never saw light. So we, we, we were constructing bridges that we didn't need at some point. We were having dams that were not efficient and we still have. These have made our debt, and especially the electricity was the main issue. I mean, instead of building electricity, uh, an electric power uh, plant, 
we went and supported the generator mafias. So it's a whole country running on generators, not to mention this, the, the pollution that comes out of this. So this is one of the main problems that led to our downfall economically, the electricity, the power uh, systems were sucking money out of uh, multi-million, sorry, millions of dollars each year from uh, our uh, money and taxes. There was no plan by our government, any of the conservative government, were always throwing the responsibility on each other. One is saying the other didn't let me work, the other says, yeah, I wanted to do the plan, yeah, I'm the best, yeah, he's the bad guy. And we, were part, we went on for 20 years pointing out at each other, and the result is you still have to switch like an, an aviation operator at your home, two, three times a day, you have to click switches to know if it's a generator or if it's electricity or what the, hell, what the hell, where are you getting your electricity from? So this is daily life. Above all of this, what led to the explosion of the port, although the investigation is not finished yet, so we do not have a definitive answer, but I can tell you from personal experience, I was the first to be on the ground when the explosion happened. One of the main problems is also, when it comes to this explosion, is corruption. How? When you, when you put incompetent people at the port as, as the port authority, when you put incompetent people as head of security forces in Lebanon, when you put incompetent people in ministries, all of this, these incompetent bunches will lead to this explosion because they knew since 2013, 14, 15, 16, they were just, the problem is if they were reading the paper that said so, it's a big problem. And if they weren't reading, this is a scam. So on both cases, it is a case of corruption. The president and the prime minister were informed lately, 20, by the 20th of July, that this, these materials have been there, these chemicals have been there for like seven years. So they can't just go and say, well, why did the other government, or the, the, the government before us do nothing? So, okay, they didn't do anything. They should be accountable. But you as, as, as government as well had the chance to retrieve these chemicals, get them out, do something about it. But it comes down from the smallest person who's in charge at the port authority, and it goes up the ladder. The responsibility goes up the ladder. Had we moved these chemicals, or dealt with them in an efficient way, we would have more people alive. We wouldn't have 7,000 people dead today in Lebanon. We wouldn't have, uh, sorry, 7,000 7, injured, and we wouldn't have more than 200 people dead. And uh, at least some people wouldn't be homeless. UNICEF is saying 100,000 children are now homeless. 300 people are displaced from their homes. You don't want to see Beirut in its state personally i've 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 seen a lot of wars i've been around lebanon when entire families hospitals churches mosques everything have, has been leveled to the ground by this explosion why because some stupid guy did not do his job and because those bunch of incom uh, in incompetent schmucks have been running the country like you run a toilet so this is a very, very, very much, uh, this, this is the main problem we have had in Lebanon. And I do know that every Lebanese has his political opinion, he supports the political party, this is the Lebanese society. However, in, in this crisis, it is very clear that this was a joint venture. What happened in Beirut was a joint venture. Since everyone was aware, and since everyone has the files, the question today, the main question is why did, did uh, no one do anything? Why did no one even at least try to move them? So what, what happened after this, except the death and the injury, we are now in a three-dimensional catastrophe. Corona, we have hit 500 cases today, 500, latest numbers, one hour ago. Our hyperinflation is doing very good, 7,500 for one dollar, Lebanese pounds versus dollars, 7,500. And on top of that, you have 300,000 people who are homeless. Now, you might say, okay, but everyone vowed to help, guys. Some people are sending money. The U.S. is here. The French is here. 
Well, after doing the calculation, and the experts have, have, have been doing these, these efforts lately, it is not enough to restore our economy. It is, not, it is barely enough to restore Beirut to at least 50% of its former glory. We need the $15 billion to get Beirut looking like it was. It wasn't, very, it wasn't looking very good, I have to admit. It was running short on everything lately. So on top of that, we have this three-dimensional problem. We have other political problems, and we have weapons to deal with on the Lebanese territory. When I say weapons, it's not just, not just the weapons that everyone thinks of, Hezbollah. It's also we have the Palestinians, we have other entities that have guns and have uh, forces on the ground. So these factors are also factors of instability away from the political, uh, uh, let's say, dimension. We have to, to mention that the, anyone holding a uh, um, militia group or just weapons or a certain independence from the state also sucks from the state because it's, he be comes certainly in a certain manner an outlaw and this will cost the state even more to pay for uh, more security, to pay electricity, to, 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 to manage the crisis. So on top of that, we have also the Syrian refugees who are here and they too have suffered from the latest disaster. So they too need support. They too are not allowed to go back to their home. Bashar al-Assad is not taking anyone in. So at, on top of the four million and a half that we have as Lebanese, we have a group of Palestinians and we have, we have almost half a million Syrians, Syrian refugees in Lebanon. So these are all sitting in a small country, 10,000 uh, five, uh, 452 square kilometers, and we are holding this burden together. I might say that this will lead, and it is leading, in fact, to many people leaving the country in a state of emergency. I know a lot of people from my surrounding who have left the country so rapidly that they didn't even pack their own bags. A lot of people are planning to do so. You see people lined up at embassies. They just want to fly out, get removed from Lebanon, take their family to safety. Now, for, to be positive, what should we do? What can we do in order to have a sort of rebirth? At, in the past, they used to say that we have gold reserves. So, so long for the gold reserve, but because they didn't really help us a lot recently in the crisis. Our hyperinflation is healthy enough and the gold is not doing anything. The gold reserves are not helping. It, seems it, it was all an illusion that we had. So what is, the, what is the rescue plan? The rescue plan is a new political system, a new, politi a new government, a new parliament, a fre fresh faces. How do we get fresh faces? They are there already. They are there, but they will need votes. And votes, unfortunately, cannot come entirely from Lebanon. So here is where I support and I always support it. Uh, expats also taking part in the elections. When the Lebanese abroad take part in the elections of Lebanon, this will change a lot because when elections happen in Lebanon, the first thing the politicians do are, is pay the people to get reelected. They buy the voices and people are getting poorer. So my fear is that with the, with the current situation, they will buy people again, they will buy votes again, they will buy uh, their seats in parliament. The only way to get to an independent democratic election is through a vote that includes expats outside Lebanon because, because those are free, are living on their own means, away from the reach of corruption and politicians, and they have a better idea of what the country should look like. Because any expat now living in the worst country in the world is not close to what is Lebanon today. So this can be our safety plan. We need vote, fresh votes, fresh faces in parliament, and we do need the plan because the current state is unable to provide us with a plan for our future, unable to sustain the future of our kids. I have to mention that five of the main schools in Lebanon have been leveled to the ground now because of the uh, explosion. Two of the main hospitals, which were brand new, providing five-star services, taking care of people in the capital, are now 
in the most miserable state you can ever imagine. So uh, we, we are universities as well, embassies, a lot of the services that any capital should have has been shaken by what happened in Beirut. So these are factors that will destabilize our society for some while, for a while. Now, as, as, as I'm talking to you, I was uh, today in Beirut shooting a documentary and I happened to pass by uh, a, ro uh, a certain uh, uh, town uh, next to Beirut, which was destroyed. If you see the people sitting outside their homes without windows, without doors, without fridges, nothing, you wouldn't imagine that it's Lebanon. I've seen this, but in Mauritania. I've seen it in Aleppo in 2012, not in Lebanon. And I have to tell you, and that's a personal opinion, it puts us to shame to see people offering support and bread to a once pride na proud nation. We are the people who had Khalid Gibran at some point. We are the people who had Amin Malouf. We are, we are success stories all through the globe. And today we're be, we've been offered bread just to survive the day. And this hurts even to see it. Even if I'm not affected personally, but just to see people begging for bread is so miserable and it's something that should never happen again so this 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 whole image that emerged after the explosion is something to really allow this country to go to a state of rebirth because we cannot continue as such today it was the port tomorrow i don't know what it, actually before we had this port issue and the explosion during the four weeks before the explosion Personally, I entered with security forces to four storage facilities where expired food items from fish to meat to uh, other different food uh, items were labeled as new and sold again in the marketplace. So they were selling poison to the people and they were bribing some officials to keep their mouths shut. So this is the kind of corruption we're talking about. It is a state that is, in, in a way or another, murdering its people. And this should stop, I think, with the help of the international community, with the help of the expats if they get to vote, and with the international pressures, a pressure uh, made by the friends of Lebanon, I think we will be able to see a sort of a light at the end of this dark tunnel. So this is mainly the, 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 the whole image today in Lebanon. I would love to hear what your questions are and perhaps elaborate more on what you might want to ask. Does anyone have any questions? Um, I can for sure put you under mute. Okay, go for it. Hi, George. Good evening. Thank you for everything. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Hi. Uh, Good. I, I was listening to what you said about the situation and uh, what the catastrophe I've had in Lebanon. Uh, uh, you said it's uh, the reason it's a responsibility of all the politicians you have had since 30 years or more. Uh, what do you think when we have had the new government this one has been uh, chosen to rebuild or to, to uh, not to, to rebuild, to, uh, to arrest all the, or the corrupted person and to make the, uh, the reconstitution of So now they now uh, they do anything now why and what is the reason is it is it political but as we know that this government was uh, was uh, supported by two two forces two big forces in lebanon which is hezbollah and Tayyar Launi. why he couldn't do anything for this okay it's an interesting question why this government or government or any government cannot do what you said, arrest and uh, hold accountable and put in jail and all of these normal things in normal countries. 
because we, we have a saying in, in Arabic, in Lebanese, I'll try to find it in English, but we, they say, so when, when they bury the corpse together, you know, they are all partners in this. The new government is a new copy of the previous one with different faces. Even the, the, the head of the government, which was the prime minister, if I ask you who supports him in Lebanon, you will not find two single people from his own entourage. He was someone selected just to obey, to obey the orders of forces that are in power. And when I say forces that are in power, all of them, those who did not resign from parliament today, are also accountable. So they are still taking part of the cake. Those who facilitated the arrival of the current uh, uh, system and the current politicians and the current presidency and the current, uh, the current prime minister, all of them are partners at the end of the day. And whenever it arrives to tell someone, I have this file against you, he gets a call from the other side and he tells him, hey, I have your man on the other side. You get my man in the Ministry of Economy, I get your man in the Ministry of uh, uh, Energy and uh, Water. So everyone forgets about it. They go happy back home. Who gets it? We get it. We get it. They rob us together. So I think I can say in a very, very positive and clear and precise way that none of them ha has the will or the power to stop corruption or to hold anyone accountable. They have all had their hands inside corruption until their heads. So the, those who are the thieves, the thieves cannot stop thieves. You need correct people to, to stop thieves. So they are stealing together. This is why I told you as a pers personal choice, I never voted because who to vote for? I know that each and every one of them at some point will meet with the other and will hold a conference on my account at the end. They will do it. They will get on one table and those who will pay the price are those innocent people who are today dead. So I don't think anyone from the current politicians, those in parliament and those outside can do anything. They have been inside corruption for 30 years. So they have, they have a lot of common grounds together, common files, common corruption cases. They are everywhere together. Even if you, if you look at some economic uh, structures in Lebanon or private entities, private businesses, Birri in politics, for example, not to, I'm not just mentioning him, but he came to my mind. Birri could be against the Lebanese forces in, in politics, which is a current a status quo since forever. But recently I discovered that some MPs and businessmen have businesses with him. Mm. And so they, are, they, are, they, have, they hold chairs together in a certain company. So above the table, everyone is against everyone. Under the table, they divide the money with each other. Business. You get a public beach, they place their hand on it. They get shares. You take your shares, I take my shares. It's for, sorry for uh, the statement I'm going to say, but that's the things are, and that's how things are in Lebanon. It's a Christian area. Okay, who holds power here? Either Tayar or Kataib or uh, Lebanese forces. Barry wants the beach. He wants to turn something public into something private. He goes there. He tells him, okay, you get your share. You give me the beach. It's done. Deal concluded. So this is, this is the type of small businesses and small corruption that we're talking about. And it goes up to different levels. Petrol, energy, everything. Do you not think, do you think that before the 4th of August will be different as the after the 4th of August? It means the after 4th of August will be before, better, will change something? What happened? I, I, would like, I would like to think so, you know? I would like to think so. Definitely lives of people have changed. People have nothing to lose anymore. I know that for a fact. Someday you'll get the chance to visit Beirut and you'll discover what I'm telling you about. The, the films you're seeing on TV and the reports you're seeing are very gentle compared to what is happening on, on the ground. It's devastating. So I think that this has marked people a lot. They're bound to change. They already, I, I know from my personal discussions with people on the ground that they cannot even look at the picture of some politicians and head of states and... and, and they are disgusted. And to tell you the truth, I have seen a report that was done with our president on BFM TV. It's a French television. So I wanted to ask you I about will, this. <laughs> I, I will take the statement he gave. I'm not, I'm not 
with or against. I'm just giving you the statement so you can judge for yourself. When she asked him and told him, Macron went and saw the people and he touched ground and he walked in the streets. Why haven't you met your people until now? So his answer was, I went to the port. And then she said, yes, but the people. He said, I cannot mix with people now. So I what? think that answer, that answers, he cannot mix with people for now. So this answers even the state of mind of those in power today. If I am in power and I hold, if I'm a manager, I'm a manager today. If I cannot talk with my employees and be with them, why the hell should I stay a manager? Why should I stay in power? One of the main things of being a manager is dealing with people day to day. So uh, the absence of this contact shows you that something changed before and after 4th of August. Uh, okay, the, 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 the example here, we took the president, but the case is similar to every, each and every one of them. We've, see, we've seen some politicians on the ground, but where they, were, they went to places where they know they are secure, that they wouldn't be hit with a shoe or with a bottle of water, so they arranged it, they staged it. Every one of them is not welcome anymore among the people. Okay, thank you. <laughs> All right. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, yeah, thanks. It's Yunan Nassif. I'm from France. Thanks a lot, George, for your sharing information and knowledge. Thanks for the WLCU for the swap talk. I, I used to work in the political field, and now as a French Lebanese person, I'm uh, a lot deceived by the reaction of the Lebanese people. I don't trust the reaction. As you said, tomorrow before election, I will be paid and I will change the report. Uh, for me today, I can see Lebanon like two, um, minimum two projects. Uh, one who's trying to win the second project. For example, the project of Hezbollah in, in Lebanon. Uh, I can understand that he is defending him, but we can't see another project against him to, to defend the the other Lebanon that, for me, I dream of having it. Uh, is it a problem that in Lebanon, the politics or the diplomacy or being gentle doesn't leave us, lead us to something? Is it always we have to uh, pass through like civil war or take our dignity with, uh, with the arms? I don't know if today even the French diplomacy or all the, the how to say, the occidental diplomacy and work through outside to inside. But I don't believe that maybe it's going to take time. But uh, if, if Lebanese people could take the chance and change their destiny, will they do it diplomatically or by arms? What is your real opinion? Uh, thank you for what you just said. I, I agree on a large part with you, large part. I'm very happy you mentioned this. It's a very smart uh, uh, opinion you have there because I have to get back to answer you to the first day of what we call the revolution. I still don't call it a revolution, guys, because I've read about revolutions in the world. Revolutions is dec decapitating those in power, throwing them in jails, uh, wiping out the whole political system. This was something. I don't know what to call it. It's, I have to check well, Merriam-Webster to find the right word. So uh, the, the thing is, when I went on the ground at 9.30 that evening, 17th of October 2019, I will tell you the story and you decide on your own. I will not tell you my opinion before telling you the story. I was going to interview a guy. I was in Zouk Mosbe, next to a, a famous shop where you all eat knefe, I hope, when you come to Lebanon. It's called Sisuit. So I was there, and there was a lot of people. Technically, they were random people. And I've been doing the job for 20 years, so these things don't go, they don't pass by my eye very easily. So I was interviewing the first guy, and he seemed genuine. Yeah, we want to change. We need to, uh, the guest guy, I hate Jubran Basile, blah, blah, blah. Okay, this is a political opinion. Strike. I went to the other bunch of people, and then a guy comes like that. and said, hey, 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 hey. My hada. Don't talk to anyone. Talk to me. I told him, why should I talk to you? But, but this is something everyone can talk. It's a revolution. So everyone went on the street, technically, without force, without being invited, Lebanese flags. 
everyone is non-political, everyone hates the political parties. This is the atmosphere, or at least this is the way they wanted to brand it. To say that people are there on their own, independently, without any political affiliation. Who was this guy? Who was selecting who should talk, who should not talk? And when I asked them, who's this guy? He said, he's in charge. When you have someone in charge, it's not an independent movement. This is the beginning. It's a small town, Lebanon. I know who the people are. I know what their job was, were. were. I know where, they politi where their po political mind is. We know each other. And you know that. I'm sure that most of you who live outside of Lebanon, if you come to Lebanon, you know who is the son of who and who is the cousin of who. So on the roads during one month after the October 17, I saw people who used to be in political parties by name. They were controlling the tire burning on the ground. They were controlling closing the roads. They were controlling the sandwiches. Okay, I don't want to say that if you're poor and you go on the street because you're poor, how does a poor person have the means to feed 1,500 people with sandwiches? If someone pays for it, said then someone is running it. Totally so we agree. keep it done or done in French, they say. You give, you give the orders. So I was once invited to run for elections with, with, with a political party that is a minimal political party, newly born, independent political party. As, except from the fact that I never had political ambition and I love my job and I'm going to remain at it. At least people, I can still talk to people with, with this kind of job. So uh, I asked one question. I told him, okay, thank you for offering me this opportunity. Who's going to fund my campaign if I decide to do it? He said, oh, we'll give you $400,000. dollars did you give me this for free? He said, yeah. Tell why? Why do you want to give me this? He said, and, and where did you get it from? He said, independent people are paying to help us sustain. I said, Don't tell me independent people. Tell me, where did you get the money from? And he just answered me, we get $5 million a year to promote independent people. I told him, okay, go promote independent people. I will not enter in this chaos. So even those who are telling themselves that we are independent, are not so independent. And this is, this is the main thing that was putting me in clash with some of my colleagues that were not understanding the way that you and me are seeing things. So uh, I used to tell them, Ya Jamea, it's not a revolution. It's political parties who, for I some reason, reason, they took their flags, they stashed it away, they put up the, the Lebanese flag because in case Lebanese anything flag. goes wrong, in case there was blood, in case there was war, no one would be held accountable. They learned the lesson. 1975, I can tell you who are the political parties who did the war. And you can tell me. There are books that tell us, tells us. But today, if anything goes wrong with the Lebanese flag, okay, no, we don't have anything to do with it. We're not there. We're not part. The, the political parties were working under what they called independent movements. And they were not independent. independent. There were among those. People like my sister, who's not politically affiliated, have friends that do not know who Samir Jara and who Michel Aoun Aou is. They don't know anything. They're apolitic. So, but they went on the streets because they were against the WhatsApp thing. They went against it because the prices were going up. They went, they went against it because they think that the yani, There was a sort of independent movement, but it was not the base. It was uh, the outcome. There, was people, there were people who joined. This is a big thing, it's growing, let's do something, let's try, let's do it. Personally, I never believe that it will lead somewhere because I know what you all know. Political entities and parties are like cancer. They are everywhere, everywhere. And they've learned how to live with the system. I, I want to thank you, thank you, George, for the, this, um, this feedback. I want to complete my question with, when we had the revolution uh, phenomenon, um, when you want to kill the ambition of the people, you globalize all people in the same uh, field. So you say all means all. For me, as a French person, in the, how to say, in the reflection, I can't be in this uh, reflection, in this philosophy. I want, okay, all means all to be accountable, to, be, to get really a good accounting uh, system. But is it for that, since when the revolution took this slogan for us, for us, for me, it was so doubtful to believe that you have an independent revolution that I respect, 
I'd w I want to see if it's going to be more and more for, uh, go away in this, uh, in this field. But we cannot, uh, we cannot, it's for me unfair to say all people are the same. No, all people are the same. Once they are, account, uh, if you have a system to, be, to account them or to, to check really if this person did a bad politics, or a clientelism politics or not. This is one. I'm against all means all without the ending of the phrase if we judge of the people really were bad. I'm with a system, fair system, politics, politicians who are bad, we have to see that are, are bad, and good people or good politicians, we have to say they are good. We can't, we can't mix the good with the bad. I, I believe we have good and we, I believe we have bad. The slogan, we, uh, I can't believe in the slogan. For that, for me, the independent way, for the independent revolution, I didn't trust it. Uh, we worked with it, but we had, for me, I had a lot of, uh, is it true what we are living? Is it true when we mix good people or we say all people are bad and this is the all people that we chose? This is not the people that were, that were imposed. This is the first question. And the, uh, to complete the first and the second question, how really in the diaspora we can help? Because today, I feel how we are help? powerless. We, how we can help? Not uh, food help or money help. How we can really, exactly. I feel we are powerless. Really, I feel we are powerless. Today I we understand. are talking, but tomorrow something, uh, something will change. I just said tomorrow they will pay it. They, uh, they are so organized uh, against us. They have. They, they master the, the, the Lebanon better for, uh, from us. Maybe you are so kind with, with this another project. How we can help? Is it the Lebanese way we can help? Or we have to enter maybe like diplomatic, uh, everyone in the diaspora will enter the, for me, for example, the French council or some French politics and then do like some lobbying to help to, re to recover the Lebanon that we dream. Thank you, Yunan. I don't believe that Lebanon will... Okay, thank you. No, no, it's, it's all right. I just want to say, if we could summarize that, just to say how us as diaspora could, could play our part more. How can we give more? Um, not, not just, you know, as, as, as Yunan said, monetary or food, uh, in-kind goods, but how can we play our role more? And then we'll move on because we have a, a few more questions to get to. Sure. I'm going to answer the two parts of this question because the first part, the part is equally important. The first part is about having all in the same basket. From my own experience and from watching them closely, and this is my job, like the carpenter works with wood, I work with news. So I see them every day, I listen to them on air, off air, I read them every day, I compare 20 years of variables through their statements, their acts, their changement, their political affiliation, their political conflicts. So I can say that when it comes to political, to the political system or the politicians in Lebanon, everything, everyone is guilty until proven innocent. It's the other way around. Because at some point, some of them led others to power. Some of them shut their eye when they saw corruption and took on the slogan, what can we do? They are the majority. You, what can you do? Get out of the government. Don't just put your signature on corrupt files. Don't approve the, 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 the uh, let's say, the, the, the robbing of, of, of uh, public funds and the theft that happened. They put their signature and then three years later they tell you, no, 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 we are against this. We don't want anything to do with them. They're corrupt. They're corrupt, but you sat with them on the table and you signed the paper with them and you let them rob your country. I'll give you a small example. Each politician, and his lovely wife are kind people, you know, they want to show this kind image. So they come, they do this NGO, and this is very trendy now, since it's five, 10 years, and they take money out of the Ministry of Tourism. So from this pocket, my pocket, my right pocket, they take the money out of here, and his wife puts on her beautiful dress, and she goes on and says to the people, I am going to do a festival for you, to entertain you, to, to let you enjoy life, and she gives them free tickets. And she tells them, I want to re revitalize the area. I want to support our areas. I want to bring festivals. I want to bring international singers to Lebanon. I'm here to help you, to support you from your own money. But she doesn't say this. From their own money, from taxpayers' money. So they take it out of our pockets. 
they put some in their pockets and then they do festivals. I don't want festivals. Just don't touch my money. Go get me some power and electrical power. This is the main issue. So the main issue is they are taking our money and just telling us, I'm giving you a service for it. What kind of service are we getting? So this is also a form of corruption. Every one of them has his own part and role to play in the corrupt system. Those who are not in power are those who did not, who did not touch the public funds. On the second level, what can you do as expats? Of course, lobbying is most important. I loved one thing one old lady told Macron when he was working with Germany. She told him, please, Monsieur Macron, do not give money to our government. They are corrupt. And I tell you the same thing, urge the international community to boycott them, to put their hands on their money in Swiss banks. This is the only way they will stop entering power. They are in power for the money. They are in power for the deals. Let them issue sanctions on them, forbidding them to open accounts and put placing their accounts, freezing their accounts abroad. Some politicians have been there for 40 years and they've been sucking the hell out of this, uh, this country. So their money and their billions are outside while we are starving here. Lobby against this, let them freeze their assets and give it back to the people and help them. So this is the main thing you can do. And whenever you send money, send it to NGOs, send it for your own families. Never, ever, ever support a, a governmental entity until you see some fresh faces out there. Because everything you put, you're putting in an empty bucket. It will filter down. Thank you, George. Um, we have um, Mr. Sergio Lohano. Um, I'm just going to unmute him now. Hello. Yeah, George, I want to congratulate for this conference. It's very interesting. Um, I live in Mexico City and I work for the World Lebanese Union. And we are getting uh, support for the Lebanese Red Cross over 25 uh, cities now. So we are very busy here uh, getting money for, for the Red Cross. Uh, my question is that. Uh, Talking about the 10 years France um, protection, uh, how 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 do you think about it? And uh, if uh, France came financing the plan uh, to reconstruct the port? Christina, can you uh, refer just for the last because I didn't hear. Yeah, yeah. My question is, what do you think? What do you think about the um, the France plan? the 10 years protection uh, for uh, uh, Lebanon to, to work with Lebanon together, uh, like in the old times, like a protection uh, from France and the financing of the France for the reconstruction of the port. Yeah, I, I get you. Uh, so mainly the French plan, like a French mandate, like we had a French mandate. I don't want to seem too ridiculous, but I think one, uh, this is a joke I always do. <laughs> Whenever we have an Independence Day, I tell them, I, tell, I always tell to the French ambassador, we miss you guys, you should return. Just a joke, I don't want anyone to have a mandate over Lebanon, but uh, at a certain point, we do need a chaperone these days because our political entity and our system, our education system has not uh, brought up civilians that have uh, an attachment to their country and to their laws. The problem is you go to Sur, Saiba, and some areas, you see Hezbollah teaching his kids how to fight and about jihad and to have loyalty to their own system, which is religious system, which is a religious system. And this creates a dissociation between Lebanese. You go elsewhere, you see someone else talking about another country. For God's sake, some people are saying they want to get back to the Ottoman Empire. So I don't think that having projects uh, that go in collision with the Lebanese identity is good. What do we do need is a system that in, engulfs all the Lebanese and at least 20 years of civic education, civic education, to get to a point where we belong to our flag, we belong to our national anthem. I can tell you something out of my experience. I, my mother is Greek. So all what I have inherited from my grandfather about Greece is still valid until now. The heroes are still the same. The national anthem is still the same. The plan for Greece is still the same. It has problems. It has corruptions like yeah, it's corruption like Lebanon. But they have a plan. They have an identity. We fail to have these. So if I want to say I want a Lebanese hero, some will say Hassan Nasrallah. Others will say no. Some will say Bashir Jamil. Others will say no. 
We do not have national heroes that we agree upon. Our national anthem, not everyone agrees with it. We do not have a common vision for our country. So, in fact, we are a land, but we are not yet a nation. We don't have a strict identity. Working on this, this is the main support that should be offered. If we were to be placed on the chaperone of an international community, if they want to do a service for this country, they should implement a very hard and aggressive civic education. Because unless we have this, everyone is going to fall back to his religion, to his plan, to his canton, to his uh, affiliation with the foreign state. So this is very important at the beginning before putting in any money to work on the education and the, the belonging of the people. Thank you. Thank you, George. We have a question. Thank you. Thank you very much. Awesome. We have another question. Um, do you think that the blast from August 4th will lead to the change the political system of Lebanon to a non-confessional system? It will lead to a change, but it's still early to decide. We have a structure called a Taif Agreement, which states that we should not be a state that follows religion. It has a plan. And if they implement it, they will reach it. But it goes again to the same issue of education. Are we ready yet? If today I open up Lebanon to democracy, and for some reason you will have Hezbollah democratically taking on the seats of the parliament. So Iran will open a mini market here. Lebanon will become a mini market for Iran. Some people might like it. But I personally don't. Uh, I don't want it to be a, something else as well. I want it to remain in Lebanon. So this is something very delicate because are the people belonging to a common project, to a common vision, to a common Lebanon? No, each and every one has his plans that are related to some faraway place in some foreign country that I don't even know the language of. So it is very important to be ready to accept and engulf such a system in order to arrive to, uh, to a Lebanon free of religious uh, dominance. After 4th of August, we will have a change, I'm sure. It will start uh, a change, but it is still hard to know what shape it will take. And I'm always afraid that this will put us in a clash together. Some people are not approving this change. Some people do not want this change. Some people, for them, this change is a change of game. And those paying them, financing them, arming them, are not happy about it. Because for, for some countries around the globe, Lebanon is just a small puppet that they want to play with. And if they lose this power, it will cost us on the inside. So one of the main problems we might face is clashes internally. Thank you, George. All right, there we go. <laughs> Sergio has a question. Uh, oh, Roger. No, thank you. Roger, you have a question. Roger, if you want, you can go ahead with yours and I'll ask after. All right, I'll move forward with my question. Um, all right, George, so I, I wanted to ask you because recently the, there's like a general uh, desire of having elections and different people in, in power, different authorities. Um, you know, we especially noticed it in October. Uh, and now again, you know, another peak. Um, uh, per personally, I, I don't know too much about Lebanese politics and, and the process, but I imagine that soon there should be uh, elections that we have to elect the government and such. Um, whether we like it or not, the, the traditional parties, let's say, they're there, you know, people who identify with them, that's each one's choice. Um, but there's also different movements, let's say more independent ones or civil, civil society. We had uh, things such as, uh, I believe it was called Beirut Medinati and, and Kuruna Watani and all these kind of things. Um, I wanted to ask you, what, how do you feel about what a, a realistic option is for the future leadership of the country? Um, I mean, uh, new generations, for example, because the friends I have in, in Lebanon, I'm, I live in Colombia, but my friends in Lebanon, they want nothing to do with, with politics. You know, you ask them about it, and they're like, oh no, you know, that, that's a different reality, that's another, another field, right? So I wanted to ask you, 
what do you think is, is, is a realistic option for the future leadership of the country? New generations, new faces, a, I don't know, maybe the diaspora could, could, get, uh, could play a role in this. Well, actually, it's a good question because you just mentioned a few names and a few entities which were good. Beirut Medinati, for example, I almost voted for them, but I couldn't because I was working. So Beirut Medinati is a good uh, option. Those fresh faces that didn't make it in the elections are good faces that can, like Nadine Dabake. There are a lot of faces I can't remember a lot of them, but Nadine is the bright picture of Lebanon. She only offered this country success and she only put, put, put us on, on, international, on international level in a very, very good position. So these are the people who offered Lebanon without taking in return. And I guess like they did in culture and arts and film, they are able to produce also better, way better than this, uh, these bunch of schmucks that are running the country since 30 years. So yes, I do believe the options you said are good options. Now, one of my personal prefer preferences, and that, that was something I really worked on during the last uh, efforts for an elect electoral law, was to involve the, the expats not in just voting, but to have at least 5 to 10% of the parliament made out of expats. Because more than 50 to 60% of Lebanese are outside Lebanon. To be honest, Lebanon now and in the future will be all full of old people, whose sons and cousins and family are supporting them to remain there, sending them money just to remain in Lebanon. So it's a big retirement home for the future, I guess. Not a lot of jobs for young people, not a lot to return to. So this is something that we have to repay as well for the expats by giving them a stay in the parliaments and in the politics, at least a ministry for expats, at least 10 to 15 uh, parliament members made out of the expats. And this was a plan under discussion, but somehow they changed it because they know that the expats will not be remotely guided and they will not be directed as they please. So I think they retracted this plan out of fear of changing and including the expats who are free-willed spirits that you cannot yield easily, that you cannot uh, juggle wherever you want. So this has struck fear inside the traditional entities uh, in the parliament, especially Hezbollah and Amal, were not very happy with it. Others as well, but mainly those, because they wouldn't guarantee the result of this kind of uh, uh, electoral law. Hello, everyone. Hi, uh, my name is Elie. Uh, thank you so much for the talk. It's, uh, it's very interesting. Um, so I'm uh, from Belgium, and I work at the European Commission in uh, EU law. And I'm always, you know, trying to find some ways to, to find some models, you know, some political models in the world in order to um, uh, be able to, uh, to change our way of, uh, of, of dealing with everything in, the, in, in, in Lebanon. And um, I realized that uh, one problem could be that, uh, you know, even if we change the government, even if we change uh, the system, uh, if we forget about religion and everything, um, I'm just thinking that could this really be uh, realistic, as you said, um, the citizens have been uh, stiffed in this kind of culture where basically everyone has their own political views, their own religion, and they identify through these two matters. So it feels like even if we try hard, even if we find a way to get a government that is uh, impartial and objective and everything, could this really work since uh, I know the Lebanese people are willing to change, but is it really possible knowing that for the past, I, I'm, I'm not going to go too far, but just for the past 30 years, let's say, people have been thinking political and religious. They have been thinking this way, yes. They have been thinking this way through the last couple of years. But this is why uh, the explosion that happened lately and the globalization and the economic crisis and the way they did not manage COVID-19 well, all of these are elements that shake 
people. When you ever you want to change the mood of people, and this is George, this is what George Bush used for 9-11. You raise the level of fears, you shake the people, and you create tension. This is what Margaret Thatcher used back in her time in the UK. She shook the people with measures and sanctions and taxes and stuff. So the people were agitated. I think that the, 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 what happened in the three, four years from the big fires to the COVID-19, to the hyperinflation, to all the lying, to seizing the money of the people in, in, in the banks, we, we, we are unable to pull our money out of the banks. So what more can happen? So these elements together are those elements that might create a big change in order for the people to take off their political and religious clothes, you need to shake them enough for them to go out and just say, I want something new. Regardless if this is some, you cannot forge the, the, the image or the shape of this new system. You have to wait and see what comes out of it. But definitely the, the, the situation we are in today and what happened through the last three years are elements that will change the circuit and will change the way the people are thinking and how they vote and how they will not vote and who they will hold accountable. It is becoming a sort of a disgust. You know, people are disgusted from everything happening and everything that has to do with traditional politicians, even religious figures. So this might change something in the future. Yes. Um, yeah, and, and then there is something else that's related to, to, to that. Um, the fact that um, I'm surrounded with a lot of uh, Lebanese people. I identify as uh, Lebanese as well, but since I was born and raised in Belgium, uh, you know, I, I try to make a difference still. Uh, and the thing is that since the explosion, you know, if you check, I mean, in my surroundings with all the people I'm, I'm, I'm hanging with and everything, and then on social media, you can see that everyone is still um, identifying with a political party while saying that they are against the government and saying that they are um, not okay with everything that's happening. And they are even, the way they talk, they think they're actually being objective, but they're not. Maybe I have a bit more of a, of a distance since I... And from which political party they come from, every single person that talks like that. So even if they want to try and change things, I mean, everyone was posting things that were actually from a very small sphere of the political system. And so, okay, I understand that they could be shaken by everything that happened, but would that be enough? Is there any other way well, there are those who are, who are posting these stuff on social media and there are equally a good number of people who just are out of their uh, political entities and parties. I know a lot of people, yeah. a lot, and I mean a lot, You're who were, uh, even they're declaring it. I, I mean, we have people like Zainal Omar, uh, for example, he was affiliated with Michel Aoun, the president, and another guy who was uh, Hisham Haddad, you know him, the guy uh, who, who was the comedian on LBC. So these were people who were hard in with politicians and this party, and there are others who were with Lebanese forces. But mainly, these are getting out and saying, Khalas, enough is enough, I'm out of this. And there are those who are traditionally with parties because they are benefiting from them sometimes. My command, these parties are, don't forget that the system is a service system. You vote for me, I get you a job. You vote for me, I get you money. You vote for me, I take care of you. Like the mafias of Italy, Godfather yeah. style. You give you scratch my back, I scratch your back, my friend. That's that's the game in the level. So there are a group of people benefiting from these thieves. This is why they will hold a certain power. Saddam Hussein still has people who support him way after he's dead because there were people making money out of this system. There are businessmen making money out of this system, not paying taxes. There are businessmen affiliated to political parties, political religious parties, to be correct and who are able to get their merchandise into Beirut while paying zero taxes. Smuggling, yeah. authentic smuggling. This is a service they give to their people to keep them quiet, to keep them on a leash. So yes, we will have that amount of people there, but there is equally a bigger amount of people letting, 
letting go of uh, that is letting go of, of, of everything that has to do with political entities and political parties, and they don't want anything to do with any of those in power. To give you an example, most of the of the of the talk uh, in, in, in a certain period of the revolution, let's say, was against, for example, Jobran Basile. He's not an innocent guy. I can vouch for that. Neither is anyone else. But, I mean, the focus on him was political, for example. Okay, focusing on him. He, he should be held accountable. That's, that's for sure. But focusing on him doesn't make the others better. There are people who supported Jobran Basile into power. And there are people who helped him and who made agreements with him and who shared the governments with him. So this is why we cannot overlook the whole problem that everyone is involved in. There are, of course, people who are visible enough, and there are people who are less visible but who contributed through facilitating the job of those, that are, those that, that are being accused of being thieves today or just um, corrupt. This is why I say there are people who actually are the head of corruption and those who are uh, being the godfathers of corruption in Lebanon and helping those uh, corrupt people getting in the money and getting them, they, they were signing with them contracts in governments, approving uh, big amounts of money for, their, for the NGOs of their wives. I mean, those who are today saying that there is corruption and stuff like that were the, the same people that signed inside the government on papers giving the wife of a very big shot in Lebanon, who's been in power for 30 years, millions of dollars into her friendly NGO, an NGO that, 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 that engulfed so much money that she doesn't even know how much she has, the, the money of the Lebanese taxpayers. So every year she gets a few millions for her pocket and says we're helping people with it. So mm -hmm. these are the, this kind of cor corruption uh, is the corruption we're facing as well. Yeah, thank you. Please. Thank you, Elise, for your question. Thank you, George, for your answer. Does anyone have any other questions for Mr. Aid? Yes, Roger. George, who is taking in charge the distributing the distribution, sorry, of all the donations? Because we saw on Facebook many of these boxes are in sell in the supermarkets. Who is thinking in charge for this? What you said before, don't send anything to the government, send it to the NGOs. Masbut, uh, certain things on social media are being exaggerated. Yani I've seen some posts that weren't true. So I have to tell you something I know about for sure. Kamen, corruption is not only within the political system. And unfortunately, I have to get back to what uh, Yunan Nasif said that people are also corrupt. Lano, what they are doing is they get they get a box filled of filled with food, and the guy coming to deliver the box has six, seven stickers for seven NGOs. He puts the first sticker, takes the photo, puts the next sticker, takes the second okay. photo. He, puts the first, he has seven pictures of the same box with seven stickers, and this is something I'm going to investigate this week as media. I'm going to mm -hmm. fry them. I have the intention of frying them because they are robbing people of their right to get food just to make money out of one single box they go and they give you four different and four different receipts and tell you i fed seven people and as a matter of fact they're giving one box to the same person with seven stickers on it so that's this is one one of the entities to get back to, to, to your question is uh what they call it the, the rescue and uh, your the rescue mission led by the yeah, government true they are, uh, they are distributing for people. But Skamen, there is a kind of chaos. Yani. There are a lot of entities out there going and working. And this chaos has created some mal, mal, ill practice. Uh, like I've told you, Hatta, there are people who are coming from faraway areas and going to the areas where the houses are burned down to take some for free and just leave. They just say to the person, hey, my house is here. Can I get a lunchbox? They get the lunchbox or the provision uh, a box and they just leave the place. So corruption is also a, a part of our people. Let's be honest. Let's not just throw it on the politicians because they are there because someone voted for them. So it's a, it's a mutual agreement between corrupt people and corrupt politicians. This is the main problem you are facing. So I, my advice to you to be practical and to find solutions Go to the NGO you trust. 
offer Joa Melhem Khalaf, uh, the head of the syndicate of lawyers, mm. is an honest guy you can rely on, at least until now. I, I, I always, I'm always reluctant to say honest because you never know what happens later. So until now, he has a proof of record of being trustful and of being correct. So this is a guy who is helping. Uh, I would tell you, research well before giving your money to an NGO. Definitely support people because there are a lot of people waiting for support. What they need today is to the effort to rebuild. To rebuild. Yes. Okay. So help them rebuild. Food is being given. What should be done today, if you have families, cousins, people you want to help, just send them money for them to rebuild. Don't give it to entities. Don't give it to the government. They will take it away. They will profit from it. Thank you. Thank you. Does anyone else have any questions for George? All right. Thank you. Thank you all, first of all, for being part of this. And uh, thank you, George, for taking the time to explain, um, give your honest opinion. Uh, this is really important, I think, for all of us to just sit in and also for us to interact with you and give our opinions and our thoughts. So we appreciate you taking the time for us today. And uh, Akid, all our strengths to you uh, in the days to come. Um, I think that's it from our end. Uh, if anyone has any other further comments, please, uh, Yunan has something to say. Okay, give me one second. Uh, thanks, George. Uh, I, I believe that we, we can work together, like on a report, uh, how the youth in the diaspora dreams of Lebanon. The Lebanon that they dream. I count on, on you to help us to, to make this reportage, we say. Maybe can, it can be a, a it can be a, a how to say in, in Federut, a road map for our youth to stay positive, to stay positive and to lead their voice and their dreams and their ambitions in a reporter. Hope that you can help the WLC use to make it to make it between us. Okay. I want okay. to I want to see our youth dream really express their dream. What is Lebanon for them and what they want in Lebanon, not just work, working like in this discussion, but working also dreaming a bit because I, I think we lost the dream also. We lost a dream. And I, I'm afraid that if we lost we lose our dream, we lose our nation. So maybe you can help uh, Christina and all the WLCU world world to make a work together about the Lebanon they dream. Sure. sure, sure. It was a pleasure meeting you guys. Thank you for your time, for listening to me, for interacting. I hope uh, you have a better future where you are and keep Lebanon safe in your hearts. God bless you all. And hopefully we'll meet in a better Lebanon someday. Inshallah. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. From, from the yeah. WSU and all of us, thank you. Have a great rest of your night. Have a great rest of your day, everyone. Thank you very much. Take care.